President Marshall. I first met Vicki Ann Trimmer in the context of uh, professional education. Uh, as a partner in the law firm of Daly, Zucker, Mileton, and Minor, with offices in Le Moyne and Harrisburg, Vicki is very active in the areas of estate planning and estate administration and taxation and has been an educator for the Pennsylvania Bankers Association and numerous estate planning councils. And I've known her to be a very effective speaker and educator on these topics. Uh, in spite of the fact that she is an attorney and a certified public accountant, she has maintained a, an ironic sense of humor and the ability to take complex topics and make them understandable by laymen and professionals alike. Therefore, it was a bit of a surprise when at the last, uh, a recent meeting, I should say, of the York County Estate Planning Council, uh, Vicki was brought in to speak about the topic which she will be presenting today. That is the dangers of identity theft. Uh, Vicki has been forced to become a bit of an uh, expert in this area, not only because of the circumstances that we all face, but she has been asked professionally to investigate this for her clients. So without further ado, allow me to turn the podium over to Vicki Ann Trimmer. It's always hard to speak after a nice lunch and everybody settling and you know, chicken or to tune out today. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about this topic. Um, it's not my area of expertise from a professional point. Um, I actually became involved with it. I'm a member of the General Federation of Women's Clubs of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm actually their state president. Um, so we're sort of like the Rotary for Women Only. <laughs> but the cool thing is, we only meet once a month. <laughs> um, one of my members was vacationing in Florida, and she stopped in South Carolina to get gas. And by the time she got to Maryland, her identity had been stolen, and she wasn't able to get gas a second time. And when she finally got back to Pennsylvania, she called me in, in a panic, um, and in helping her figure out what she had done wrong, and also what she could do in the future to protect herself, I became interested in the topic. Um, started speaking to clubs about it, and, and that has branched out to other organizations. Since then, I had a client um, who called me, telling me that his wife was a beneficiary of an estate in England, that all of her relatives had been killed in the tsunami in Asia. <laughs> okay, don't laugh, because it's possible. <laughs> okay, at least the wife thought it was possible. Um, but. I want to tell you the extent to the, these people went to. Um, the people, she was from England. Her family was all from England. People with her family's name are listed on the Red Cross website as being killed in the tsunami. So it looks legitimate that way. I didn't even know the Red Cross had a list of people who were killed in the tsunami, but they did. When she sent them, of course, she immediately gave them her bank information without talking to her husband, because um, we would all do that, right? When they called me about it and I started investigating, they had a letter from a person who purported to be a barrister from England. That person had a website. When you called that number, they answered the number as if it was a legitimate barrister. The only way we found out they were not a legitimate barrister was to contact the International Barrister Society in England who licenses them. We asked for copies of the alleged bank statements. They gave us Bank of Britain's official letterhead that they had stolen with bank account information on it. They falsified and created a complete probate package with raised <coughs> seals that they provided. This is the extent people will go to to steal your money. Okay. Yeah. We all hear about the ones on television. There's one going on right now. But do you, anybody use ATM machines? Okay. I will tell you that I am paranoid. I do not carry credit cards. I deal in cash. If I'm going to a restaurant, I take cash. I never use my credit card where it leaves my possession, and I never use my credit card where I can't see the wires connected to the machine. Because I can go on the internet, and for $15, buy a little device that's no bigger than my pinky, that I can hook on the wires of any computer that will track every keystroke on that computer. 
I can take it home, download it, and then I have everybody who ever used that computer, every person who ever slid their card. Now, the new <coughs> chip cards are supposed to eliminate that. Okay? You'll note the word I didn't say, the new chip cards will eliminate it. Okay? They have worked in Europe. They have worked in other countries to eliminate or reduce credit card fraud. But all of the other countries have taken the step the United States has not done. They require a four-digit PIN. The United States has not required a four-digit PIN with the chip card because they thought we would rebel and not agree to do it. My advice to you is, if you have a chip card, call and get a four-digit PIN and always use the PIN with your chip card. Without the two things, it's like we always say it's not worth the paper it's written on, you're not getting the protection of advertising. Identity thieves are brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Every time we come up with a way to defeat them, they come up with a way around them. Um, if they used their brains for good rather than evil, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be worried about that mosquito virus in Brazil. Okay. Where's the young lady that's going to Brazil? Yeah. Is your dad there? You're sending a lot of deep with her, right? Watch as you can get there. Does the name Tiger Woods sound familiar? How about Oprah Winfrey? Okay. You know what those two people have in common with all of us? They've all been the victims of identity theft. So think about it. If the person at the bank didn't know that that wasn't Oprah, okay, <laughs> are they going to know it's not Marsha? <laughs> Pennsylvania, the, the Federal Trade Commission, and the packet I gave you has a ton of information from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, the Federal Trade Commission tracks statistics of victims of identity theft. Pennsylvania has 50% of all the victims over the age of 55 are in Pennsylvania. Okay, now that's 50% of all victims of identity theft over the age of 55 are in Pennsylvania. But that's about three years old. They haven't published new statistics. Um, the kinds of identity theft are changing. We always used to talk about credit card fraud, but now people were paying attention to that. Um, one of the areas I'm seeing, and I actually had a client who was the victim of this, was medical fraud. Um, he started getting bills from a hospital in Texas for the amputation of his leg. Um, he assured me he had both legs. We assured the hospital in Texas he had both legs, but we actually had to take him to a notary and take a picture with the newspaper of both legs, in short, so they could prove it wasn't like a fake leg. Uh, but somebody had stolen his medical insurance number and used his medical insurance number to get treatment at this hospital. Now, it's scary enough that he got the bill, but here's a scarier thought. With all of these new online electronic medical records, the next time he's in an accident when we pull up his blood type, is it his or someone else's? Because that person's stuff is now electronically tied to his numbers. So that, that, that's an even scarier thing that's happening. From a statistic point of view, some of the things we're seeing, um, elderly, huge, huge victims of identity theft, I think it's because um, especially my elderly clients trust everything and every person. Um, if you call them, they believe you. If you tell them to do something, they believe you. If they get a letter, they believe you. Um, so they're easy targets of identity theft. Um, there is a way to protect them, and I have the information in your packet. There's a process called a security freeze. Um, and what a security freeze does, and if you're over 65, this is free. If you're under 65, it's $10 for each of the three companies. You can freeze your social security credit report. If somebody tries to access it, they can't get any information. Um, so you're not going to get the free solicitations for life insurance and credit cards and things. And if somebody's trying to open up a cellular account using your or your client's social security number, they're not going to be able to pull the credit report, which means they're not going to be able to open the account. Um, I think Using the security freeze is really, really powerful. I do it for a lot of my elderly clients, especially if they're entering into any sort of assisted living or long-term care facility, um, because what we're finding is they are big targets of identity theft. Um, I had a client in a nursing home in the Harrisburg area. Um, I'm listed as the power of attorney because her daughter lives in California. So 
So I'm the first contact. And they called me and asked me if I could come to the nursing home the next day. And I went and they presented me with this garbage bag of Verizon online, Verizon wireless accounts. Well, the person who cleaned her room had been noticing that every day when she emptied this lady's garbage, the lady's 97, there was four or five envelopes from Verizon Wireless in it unopened. Because the lady's getting them and she doesn't have a cell phone, so she's throwing them away. She thinks they're solicitations. Well, after this went on for a couple of weeks, the aide who was cleaning the room took the whole garbage pail to her supervisor because she didn't want to be accused of stealing the lady's mail. So she took the whole garbage pail to the supervisor and the supervisor opened them. Somebody had opened 19 cellular accounts in her name. All the bills coming, she's not opening them, she's throwing them away because she doesn't have a cell phone. Okay. So by freezing her identity, we can prevent that from happening in the future. Another area that we're seeing with increasing identity theft is identity theft for children. Um, how many in this room have a child under the age of 21? Or a grandchild under 21? How many have checked their credit reports? Okay. Happened in my own family. When my nephew was going to have a time to hack for financial aid, he got rejected. He got rejected because somebody had been using his social security number and had outstanding loans. In your packet, there's a brochure um, pretty recently issued from the Federal Trade Commission on safeguarding your child's future. Um, they know that children are not checking their credit reports, so they're targeting them. Because you won't find it out until they apply for their first credit, which is usually when they apply for their first college loan um, or buy their first car and they need credit. Um, so it's an area that we're seeing increased risk. But just some basic things. How many of you carry credit cards? Okay. How many have more than five credit cards with me? Okay. There's one on this person. There's a couple on this person. <laughs> Anybody have more than ten? Yeah, there's a couple more. Okay, I'm just going to go this high. <laughs> if I just do it this high, nobody's going to know. There's a special session for you guys afterwards. <laughs> the reason I say this, the more things you carry with you, the more at risk you are. True example, last year in December, my brother got a letter from Sears store, and it was his Sears credit card. He had not used his Sears credit card until November a year ago. So in November 2014, he uses his Sears credit card to buy tires. November of 2015, they returned his Sears credit card. His Sears credit card had been missing for a year. Okay. You know how it came back? Guy who was in line behind him last year went this year to buy something and realized he had two Sears credit cards. Okay. If you carry multiple credit cards, you may not miss them if you don't use them all the time. So my suggestion is don't carry credit cards with you every day that you're not using every day. I understand that you want the store credit card because you get the discount. My mother was the queen of store credit cards. The woman pretty much every time she went shopping, she came home with a new credit card. Um, my father was a mortgage banker who just would roll his eyes. She'd hand him the paperwork and like, honey, look what I got. And he'd just be like, just use the discount. Um, but don't carry credit cards with you that you're not using every day. I have a Kohl's credit card. I use it only when I get the coupon in the mail that they get 40% off. If I only get 25% off, sorry, Kohl's, I'm not coming. Because I know you're going to give me 40. Uh, but I don't carry the credit cards because if you're in a store and you open your wallet and one falls out, are you going to miss it? Are you going to notice it's gone? The other thing is, how many of you have photocopied front and back of credit cards? Okay, a couple people. More importantly, how many haven't? Okay. Where is the phone number to report your credit card stolen printed? <laughs> On the back of the credit card. Okay. It's true. You don't even think about it. You don't even think about it. Um, so that's your first tip. Go home, and then sometimes I'll do a test where I'll tell you to take your white envelope and I'll ask the ladies on your envelope to write everything that's in your purse, and the men to write everything that's in your wallet without looking. Because that's what you have to do if you go home tonight and your wallet is missing. You have to try to remember what you had with you that day. 
And if your house is like my house, you're trying to remember it while your significant other is screaming at you for being an idiot. <laughs> when you're under the most stressed. So that's your first tip, is make a list of what you carry with you, photocopy credit cards front and back, so that if they do get stolen, you have the information to report them stolen. Okay. Companies are paranoid about identity theft. Um, it, it's almost to the point that you know, we, we wanted big business to be paranoid about it, but now we've crossed the line. I have the old-fashioned copper phone line in my house. Um, probably one of the few people in central Pennsylvania who still have rotary phones, which is fun because when my nephew can list with me when his friends come over, they don't know how to use my phone. <laughs> First of all, it has a cord. Yeah. But then they have to like dial. We have that because it's the only phone my mother could hear with about. It was the loudest bell we could get. I got a letter from Verizon telling me that they're no longer going to support copper lines. I have to convert to a Fios line, a fiber optic line, which they will do for free if I call this 800 number to schedule an appointment. So I call the 800 number to schedule the appointment, but I have to have my account number. Okay. I don't have my account number because I, I hate paying bills, so I write a check for $500 once a year to the phone company and I don't get a bill for the rest of the year because I am not giving the government 48 and a half cents every month for 20 months. Okay. I don't have my account number. So she can pull my account number, she can tell me where I live, I can verify where I live, but she can't make the appointment because they're paranoid that somebody is going to try to make an appointment to install Fios at my house illegally. <laughs> okay. That's how paranoid we've gotten. Is it good that they're trying to protect us? Yes, but it's also gotten them so. Um, what about Medicare cards? Anybody have a Medicare card? There's got to be people who drink one Medicare cards. Medicare is the only insurance system in the country that refuses to change the ID number. Uh, there is a federal law that says they were supposed to have done it a couple years ago and stop using your social security number, but they still use it. You have to be careful because once they have your social security number, they have the keys to the kingdom. With your, social, with your name and about $19.95 in five minutes, I can get all of the information I need about you on the internet. Sometimes they run a special, it's 99 cents for the first week. Okay. If I have your social security number, I have the keys to your kingdom. So you have to be really careful with the paperwork that has your social security number, so your Medicare cards. Um, I have advised my parents not to carry their Medicare card. Um, it is not in their wallets anymore. One, because my mother can't be trusted not to lose her wallet, hence the father screaming at the mother for being an idiot. Um, but I tell her, you know, if you have to go to the doctors, they know your information. Use your driver's license, they can look you up. If you're taken to the hospital in an emergency, they're going to treat you if it's life-threatening, plus you're probably going to call me and I have the information. Okay. Now, I can tell you, if you're with me and I need my ID or I need my mom's insurance information, it's going to take us a few minutes to get it because it's in my car. Okay. Any idea where I put it in my car? No, it's not the glove compartment because Steve's know to go to the glove compartment. Mine is underneath my spare tire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, I had a state trooper. I witnessed an automobile accident. And he's like, ma'am, I need your insurance and ID. I'm like, why? I'm the witness. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, well, we still have to have it for the report. I said, well, it's going to take us a couple minutes. And he's looked at me and I said, it's under my spare tire. And, you know, he's a typical state trooper. They don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> They're not CPAs, but they still don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't pick up CPAs because I'm one of them. So we went to the back of my car and I unscrewed thing and we lifted the tire out and there was the envelope that had everything in it. And then afterwards he said to me, he said, yeah, that's such a cool idea, I'm going to tell my parents to do it. He said, because nobody would think to look there to steal your information. Okay. It's all about reducing your risk and your exposure. Do you think about who's in line with you at the grocery store when you're using the keypad? Do you think about who's in line with you when you're at the doctor's office? And you give them your social security number or your Medicare number? Do you think about who's in line with you at the medic? Okay. We used to have to be worried about the person standing behind us. Now you have to be worried about the person standing across the room on their cell phone. 
Because they would be on their cell phone taping what you're doing. And you would never know it. My nephew used to work for a large grocery store. I'm not allowed to tell you the name of the store or I would get sued. Uh, but he was working as a cashier one Sunday. And he came home and he was all excited. He said, like, Vicky, 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 I have to tell you what happened. I'm like, honey, what happened? Calm down. He says, I was working as a cashier. And he said, there was a man there. And he had this nice suit and a tie on. And he said he had a clipboard. And he had little bags that said the name of the store and his name. And he said he'd been there all day. And finally, a customer came through and was very uncomfortable and said, I want to know why that man is standing there. And my nephew said, I don't know, he's been there all day. So he called the manager over. The man had been standing there all day stealing people's information. From where he was standing, he could see both the register and the keypad. So he was writing down the numbers that came up on the register for their car, for the store and then had their code from the keypad. He'd been there for several hours before a customer complained. And of course, by the time they went and figured out who he was, he was gone. But they, had, they were able to see on tape what he was doing. Okay. He looked legitimate because he had a suit and a tie on. And he had a badge on. Okay. These people know how to pretend to be legitimate people. Okay. My staff says I make I made people paranoid, so I apologize. <laughs> they said, you just scare people. But you have to pay attention to who's with you, who's paying attention, who's doing something. With the new cameras, I mean, I can be here and I can be videotaping what he's writing in the back corner. You know, because the cameras are so powerful. My mom is notorious for trusting people, and my brother is like paranoid. He only wears jeans if the zipper's this long. So when we're buying him jeans, we go around measuring. Because if the zipper's more than that, he won't wear them because they're too tight. So we know that he wears Lee jeans. Lee riders, he likes the right zipper mix. So I took her to Sears a couple years ago to buy jeans because they had them on sale. Because my mother will not buy something unless it's on sale. And we picked out jeans for him. And of course, because that's what daddy wears, that's what his boys will only wear. Okay. So we have this whole pile of blue jeans for him and his three boys and my other brother and my dad. And we're in line and I realized that she's got jeans that are the wrong size. She picked out the wrong size. So I said to her, you stay in line because it's Christmas at Sears. I'll go exchange them. Next thing I hear is my mother's social security number over the Sears loudspeaker system. Okay. Now, I pay her bills. I know her social security number. So as soon as I heard the 182, I'm like, what? So I go back to the register and I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She said, oh, honey. She said, this nice young lady told me that if I upgrade my Sears car to a platinum, I can get another $5 off your brother's jeans. I'm like, okay, but why is she saying your social security number over the loudspeaker system? She said, oh, she didn't do that. I'm like, yeah, she did. Everybody wants what? Yeah, she did. She said, but, but I did what you told me to do. I never said it out loud. I wrote it down, I handed it to her on a slip of paper, and she gave a batch. Okay? That's a good precaution. So did you take it back? You're not leaving it in the store. Here's what the clerk did. She's on the register. One, eight, as she's typing it in, she's saying it, forgetting she has an open mic. Okay. Everybody shopping in Sears that Saturday knew my mother's social security number. Because the clerk forgot that she had an open mic on and was saying it out loud as she was typing it in the computer. So all the safety precautions that Sears has in, that you write it down, they hand it back to you, you type it in the computer, wasted because the clerk forgot she had an open mic on and can't read without speaking. Okay. I'm not making any judgments about the clerk because we've all done it. You're doing something and you're saying it to yourself as you're doing it. But you have to think about who's around you, who's paying attention. Is it worth the $5 off on the blue jeans to put yourself at risk? What about paying bills? Anybody pay bills? <laughs> <laughs> Try to avoid it. I'm waiting for the room where somebody says to me, I don't pay any bills. And then I'm going to adopt that person. Okay. Do you, does anybody still use old fashioned checks? Okay. I'm sure you're not surprised I don't use online. <laughs> I don't trust online. Okay. But you have to think about your checks. I have two checkbooks for the same checking account. One has my name and address printed on it. The other one just has VA trimmer printed on it. If I am writing a check or I'm putting it through the mail, I use that checkbook. If I'm writing a check at Voskos where they want a name and address, I use the checks that are printed. 
The bank doesn't care what order my checks are written in, but by putting the check in that doesn't have an address or anything on it, it makes it more difficult for a person if they open an envelope and steal the check, they don't know who that is. If I sign the check in front of you, you can read my name. If I sign the check in the mail, there is no way you're going to know who that is. I intentionally scribble it. So that if somebody slices an envelope, they steal the check, they have no idea, is it Vicki Ann Trimmer or is it Victor Allen Trimmer? They're not going to be able to tell because it's not proof printed on the check. Did you know that there's a chemical you can buy at the Dollar General store that will take the stains out of your clothes that will also take the ink off of the check? <coughs> and you can buy a tub of it for a dollar. It'll, it'll take ink right off the check and it won't affect the check. It doesn't leave a trace on the check. Please know this. My mother loved, do you remember when they had erasable pens? Okay. My mother loved erasable pens. Can you imagine writing a check in an erasable pen? It's like saying to the thief, here, take my money. So you have to think about when you're paying bills, what you're doing with your bills. You should never, um, and I know that there's some medical people in here who are going to say, if we have to use black ink, you should never sign anything in black ink. <clears throat> you should never write a check in black ink. You should never sign a legal document in black ink. You should always use a blue. Okay. I know hospitals maybe use black because they scan everything, but you can scan a blue. Okay. Any idea why? Photocopies. The new laser photocopies, it's very difficult to tell a black thing, the original from the photocopy, but with blue, the blue never matches exactly. It's very difficult to match blue inks. Tonight, when you go home, take four blue pens and draw a line, now not four from the same manufacturer. Okay? The four different blue pens and draw the lines and look at the differences in the blue ink. It makes it much more difficult for them to falsify a check and change the number because the inks aren't going to match. Okay? And hopefully, the teller who's cashing it will recognize that the inks don't match and question it. Um, through the mail, it doesn't give you much protection, but it gives you a little protection. The other thing you have to think about is where are you mailing your bills? Um, in your packets, there's two tests to take. Um, one is, are you putting yourself, are you at risk for identity theft? And it's just simple things we do in our day-to-day -day lives that could put us at risk. Um, and the other one is, are the businesses you do business with putting you at risk? Are the things that we do in our offices putting our clients at risk? Okay. For example, does everybody have a clean desk policy? Okay. Okay. Who has a policy? I want to know if you enforce it. Who has a policy? Okay. Do you enforce it? No. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Okay. Anybody who's cleaning your office has access to all of your client data then because you've left it open for them. When I, when I worked for a firm in Harrisburg, we had a business investment company that was on the first floor. They went to lunch one day and left their window open and somebody climbed in the window and stole the client's information. Okay. Do you require that your employees close their windows? Probably not. But you have to think about it. Do you do background checks <coughs> and all the people who the cleaning company has hired to clean your offices? Probably not. So if you don't have a clean desk policy, you don't lock client information up, you're putting your clients at risk. And that's what that questionnaire talks about, are the things we do in our business practice putting at risk. Okay? Um, I'm a tax attorney. I have a lot of clients' confidential tax information. Okay? The closet that's in my office locks, and that's where my client files are at. I have a file cabinet in the office, but there's no client information in that file cabinet. When I leave for the day, my client's information is in the cabinet, in the closet, and the closet is locked, and I am the only one that has the key. Me and the business manager. Because I don't know who's in my office in there. The other fun thing I used to do is, do you worry about what you throw away? Does anybody not have a shredder? 100% shredder. This is a prize. You should get a prize. You should give them a prize. A shredder prize. Because I was going to say, if you don't, Walmart down the street has them on sale. You need to shred everything that leaves your house. Everything that leaves your house. If it has a name, if it has an address, if it has identification numbers, if it has a barcode, if it has any letters on it, it needs to be shredded. Um, I know that um, the Ronald McDonald House is now asking people to save their store catalogs. Um, and they have bins you can put your store catalogs in. 
Everybody I know says, okay, well, I tear off my address off the back cover. Do you tear out the, the order form? Because the order form has all the same information on it. Okay. So you have to shred the order form, not just the cover that has the address on it. You have to shred everything that leaves your house. Because people drive through your neighborhoods. They know when you put your garbage out. And they drive through your neighborhoods and they steal your garbage. Did you know that under Pennsylvania law, once you put your trash at the curb, it's not your trash anymore? It no longer belongs to you. You have deemed to have abandoned it when you put it in the trash can and put the trash can at the street. They're not even stealing it. They are entitled to it. So if you have not shredded it, you're at risk. Okay. I told you earlier that I want you to make a list of all of your important information. And now I told you that everything that leaves your house has to be shredded. So the question you should say to me is, where should I put it? Where is the one safe place in your house that you can put important information that it will never be stolen? Okay. Any ideas? Okay. You have to think like a thief. Okay. Think like a thief. Where are you not putting it? Under the mattress. In the freezer. Thieves know that we put important stuff in the freezer. Okay. If somebody breaks into my mother's house and goes in the freezer, they will not only not have to eat for a year, but they will probably find hundreds of dollars in her freezer because she freezes it in milk curtains. <laughs> I didn't know she did this until I followed a carton that said soup and it wasn't soup, it was $50 bills. <laughs> non-age chicken soup and I put it on the counter and after like two hours I said to my nephew, go check the soup and see if it's getting mushy. And he squeezed it. He says, I think it's mushy. He says, but I don't think it's soup. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, it weighs way too much. It was silver dollars. An entire orange juice container of silver dollars that she froze probably ten years ago and forgot about. So if you break into my mom's house, go to the freezer. Don't go anywhere else, just go right there. Thieves go to your freezers, they know your refrigerator, they know. Another place people suggest is the inside of your toilet tank. You know what? Thieves know to go there. I will tell you where mine is in my house. It's the one place nobody in their right mind will ever go to. My important information is in a sealed envelope between the bottom of my cat's litter pan and the litter bag. Nobody in their right mind is going near you. Okay? Well, we have to have some fun here. It's a pretty hard topic. Other suggested places inside your dryer. Pull your dryer door off, tape it on the inside panel of your dryer. Thieves want to get in and get out. So you don't want to make it easy for them. So put it someplace. Um, taping it to near your electrical panel in your basement because they're probably not going to get that far. They want to get in and get out in like five minutes. So you have to think of some place that the thieves aren't going to think of to put your personal information. Okay. I know I'm out of time because my sergeant in arms has stood up, so I appreciate that. A couple things in your packet I want to tell you about. Everything in your packet um, that's printed is from the Federal Trade Commission. You get this information free of charge, they mail it to you, there's no shipping, you just tell them how many hundreds of copies you want. Most important thing in that packet is this little brochure called Free Credit Report. I think as a service to all of our customers and clients, we should be giving them this, because right in the center is the form to get your free credit report. And what I tell my clients to do is order one from Equifax, wait four months, order one from Experian, wait four months, and order one from TransUnion, which means every four months, at no cost, you can check your credit report. Okay. How much benefit is this to a client when they come in and you leave and say, you know what, have you worried about it, Debbie, that? Here, get your free credit report. Won't cost you a cent to get these and give them out. They're absolutely free. The other thing I want to point out is this big book called Taking Charge. <coughs> you do not need this book until your identity is stolen. And then this book will walk you or your client through it page by page over what to do. How to file reports, who to file reports with, sample letters to the credit union companies. Um, it tells you exactly what to do. Again, absolutely free from the Federal Trade Commission. The sheets that are in your packet that are on white paper or the things that my office has created, you have my permission to reproduce those. Okay? The only thing I ask, if you approve it, send me a copy of the approval. 
<laughs> I have not copyrighted them, I'm not copy protecting them. Please feel free to use the information if it's helpful to your clients. Um, I know I have to turn it over in three minutes, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. What's the use of your own U.S. mailbox in the front yard that you put the red flag up and basically you're telling the whole world I've got... Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't mail anything from my mailbox. I don't, I, I, I take it with me. I don't do, use my mailbox because my mailbox is notoriously being hit by cars, so sometimes it ends up at my neighbor's yard. Um, they laugh at me at Lowe's when I go to buy Lowe's. I buy mailboxes three at a time. Um, I'm serious. I'm serious. They can only, because I live at the top of the crest of a hill and they gain too much speed and they come airborne and they take out my mailbox. No, I would not put it out. Because again, it's like, you know, it's like the ice cream bell to kids. Put the red flag up, everybody in your neighborhood knows two things. You got paid and you paid your bills. And they have the keys to your kingdom when they steal your mail. So take it with you, mail it at work, put it in a blue mailbox, but don't mail it from the front of your house unless you're at home and you can put it out right before the mailbox, right through the mailbox house. Um, there was a situation in New York, right out here in New York, one of the rural roads where they have rural mailboxes and the neighbors commented to each other that they weren't getting any mail. Um, and it turned out that when they put a video camera up, somebody was driving through right after the mailman and stealing all the mail. It happened right here in York County. I think there was a question over here. Yes, ma'am. Is it safe to do the online credit check? It is safe if you use the address in that book. If you use the address on that form, but don't just type free credit report online because you, the first five that come up are not legitimate websites. Only use the website that's in that booklet. Um, if you use the right website, what will happen is after you put your information in, they're going to ask you from three to six questions. Um, do you have an account at M&T Bank? Do you have a loan at the State Employees Credit Union in the amount of? Some of those questions are intentionally wrong. It's designed to make sure it really is you who is asking for the information. Now, if you ask me the second question, do I do it online? The answer is no. I tell my clients to mail it in. Okay. I, these are just too good with computer technology. Yes, sir. When you when you stay in a hotel, the room key that you get, the swipe card. Oh yeah, what information first. is on that? It depends on the hotel system. The question is the room key. Um, and when I, when I have an hour to talk, I talk about hotel room keys. Some of the hotels, when you got that key, it had all of your information on it: your social security number, your credit card number, your mailing address. All of the big chains have stopped doing that, and now the only thing on it is supposed to be your room number. They are also supposed to be reprogrammed every time they're reused, but I can tell you I have one from a hotel in um, out near Juniata County that I have used for the last five years and stolen with that room. I go out there for a bowling tournament every year and I always take it just out of curiosity, we'll stole it from the room and it does five years later. Stole it with that room. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to be safe, take your keys with you and run them through your shredder. Don't give them back. Don't leave them on the desk, don't give them back, take it with you and shred it. Um, especially if you're on a cruise or something, because that key gets you access to all of the accounts online. Obviously on the cruise ship, they've got more than just a room number. Um, so take it with you and shred it. Um, I know I'm out of time. I'm happy to stay and answer questions afterwards. I appreciate your attention and hope you found something informative.